Welcome everyone, my name is Beryl Bender-Birch and welcome to Talking Yoga. I'm so happy that you were able to join us today. And I am also so happy to be here with Master Yogi David Swenson. David, welcome. So happy to be here, Beryl. I always tell uh, my friends and students that David is the hardest working yogi I know. <laughs> so it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. So I'm going to launch right into our basic Fantastic. questions here and ask you, um, why do you practice yoga, David? Well, honestly, it's very simple. When I practice, life is easier. When I don't practice, life is harder. And I believe that's the only reason anyone should do it. You know, you know the old Star Trek movies? When they're, you're, they're in their spaceship and the enemy ship is attacking them and shooting these <laughs> missiles at them and they push some button and they get the like force field up. And everything starts bouncing off and they're safe, but then the force field starts to diminish and then those missiles are hitting them again. To me, practicing yoga builds this like force field of prana around my body. And it feels like the, the harsh barbs of life sort of bounce off for a while. And as the shield weakens, it, life is harder. It, it hits me and it's more raw. So you get back on the mat, you build some more prana and carry on. What got you started? What brought you to yoga? You know, I'm from Texas, and everyone in Texas practiced yoga in the <laughs> 60s and 70s. I'm kidding. I know. <laughs> um, honestly, it was my older brother, Doug. He's five years older than me, and he got into surfing in, in Southern California and in Texas. And when he was in, in Southern California, he heard about yoga. He used to surf at a place called Swami's Beach, which was near the SRF, Self-Realization Fellowship in Encinitas. And he saw these guys doing stretches, so he came back to Texas. He was doing yoga, eating health foods, and that was my first interest, and we learned from books. We didn't really know what we were doing. The only books we found, I remember we had Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation by Jess Stern. <laughs> we had true. Richard Hittleman's, and I can't remember how many days to yoga it is. It's 28 days to yoga or something like that. Some number of days to yoga. And Richard then we Hittleman's found... Coffee. Swami Satchidananda's book came out, Integral Yoga around that time, and Iyengar's book. We would go to the park and practice, because as you know, there were no yoga studios, there were no yoga clothes. We practiced on bed sheets and beach towels. And we were one day practicing in the park in Houston, Texas, <coughs> under a tree. Police cars came zooming into the park. The guys jumped out with guns <laughs> and said, what are you boys doing out here? <sighs> <laughs> We're breathing and stretching, please don't shoot me, officer. And they said, well, the neighbors called and said, you were doing some kind of devil worship out here. Because they couldn't understand what we were doing. And um, at any rate, it was odd to do yoga then, but we felt something from it. Yeah. Who was your first real teacher Who was, that you actually you know, physically was, studied with? There was a woman, <laughs> I just looked up her name the other day, her name is Billy Galnick. She's now 86 years old. She lives in Houston. She was one of the first yoga teachers there. It's it's really interesting story. My family, my parents, when I was a little boy, they were involved in the Unitarian Church in Houston, Texas. And there was a, it might have been the first Montessori school there. It was founded by a guy named Dr. Ernest Wood. Only later as an adult did I find out Dr. Ernest Wood wrote all these yoga books. He translated Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. He spent years in India. He spoke Sanskrit. I remember seeing him as a kid. Yeah, This woman, Billy Galnick, was one of his early students, like in the 50s. And then she started doing, so she was doing a little bit of yoga, but it was very informal. We'd pop into a class, but for the most part, we learned from books. In 1973, I went to Southern California and met David Williams and Nancy Gilgoff, who happened to be teaching Ashtanga, and they were my first real, like, this is a person that's, that's teaching me directly. My brother and I sort of practiced together, and we learned from books. So you first started studying with David Williams in California or in Hawaii? In, in California, California, yeah. This was pre-Hawaii day. So, David Williams and Norman Allen, as, as you know, were the first American people, not the first Europeans, because there was Andre von Lesbeth before them had met Patabi Joyce, but Norman Allen and David Williams were traveling around India. They, they come across this guy, Patabi Joyce. They started learning the yoga from him. Norman went back to New York teaching there. David went to Southern California, and I met him like about a year after that. 
after so the first trip. Just to add a little bit to that, David's talking about the practice that he does, which comes from the Krishnamacharya lineage. Uh, Krishnamacharya students, as many of you know, uh, BKS Iyengar, Pitabi Joyce, his son Desikachar, Indra Devi, and David Williams had studied, as David just explained, with uh, Patavi Joyce, who his system has come down to us uh, referred to as Ashtanga Yoga or the Ashtanga Vinyasa Asana system. And that's been David's practice for Since how many? 1973. <clears throat> so it's now been, what is that, 41 years. So what are you working on now in your own practice? 41 years? Right? Things have changed a little bit, right? Well, I remember when you started, you were probably working on mastering handstand. What are you but working you know, on thing, now? You're right. Things are always changing. That's the beauty of the yoga. People say, well, what would I be doing had I not done yoga? I don't know. So it's hard to compare, right? But what I'm working on now is carrying on and doing yoga the rest of my life. Carrying on as a tool. Our relationship with yoga, regardless of the system, in the beginning, when we come to find yoga, for the most part, people are excited. It's new. It's like, wow. It's some sort of like a new relationship. It's a new love. And you're, oh, and for me it was Ashtanga. Wow. Oh, Ashtanga, I love you so much. I can't wait to see you tomorrow on the mat. And I love you. And then after a few months, you're like Ashtanga yogi. You left the toilet seat up again. <laughs> and little things in the relationship start to bug you. So your relationship... When something is new, you're making a lot of progress, and you're feeling better, and it's very easy at that point. Then we hit what I would call the plateau, right? You make a lot of progress, and then you hit this zone where nothing much is changing. And people can get discouraged during this, but it's honestly where the vast majority of our time will be spent as a practitioner is nothing much changing. There's points of big progress, and then it's sort of imperceptible. And when we get frustrated on the plateau because we feel like nothing's changing, I'm not getting better. And then one day we feel, oh, something's changing. I feel a change. <laughs> it's getting worse, right? Like, oh. And people get so frustrated, they go away from the yoga. And one day we wake up and we have a realization that, wow, when I was on that plateau, it felt really good. But it was so normal, I forgot how good I feel. So we start the practice again and get back on the plateau. If you look at the, the main deities in Hinduism, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma creates, Vishnu maintains, and Shiva destroys. Who has the hardest job of all? Vishnu. It's easy to create something, it's easy to destroy something, but to maintain something is difficult. So we can create a yoga practice, we can destroy one, but maintenance. So I approach my mat every day, and I've trained myself to be happy with whatever I'm able to do that day. If it's Patabi Joyce's minimum daily practice, which he said was three Surya Namaskar A, three B, and a final three postures, I do that. But it's, what am I working on now? I'm working more on what David Williams, my first teacher, would say, is what you cannot see, which is where the real yoga resides. That's what I was just going to ask you. What does doing yoga mean to you now? I would say that even in the early days, though it was not as apparent to me, doing yoga meant not just what I was doing on the mat, but how it affected the rest of my day and how it gave me some kind of an inner strength and a calm that helped me to, to carry on in a way that I would not have had I not done yoga. And I have never taken any drugs in my life and I've never had a drink. I'm not saying it won't happen tomorrow. Yeah, and I have nothing against that because all my friends were all you know, people doing drugs. I hung around them, they were fun. But yoga, my brother and I said, yoga gets me high. When I did yoga, I felt better. And so to this day, I'm, I'm working on taking that yoga and that good feeling, but it shouldn't be a selfish thing. Yoga is not meant to be selfish. We have to be careful that we don't just do the yoga and it's all about how do I feel. Yeah, I feel good, but then go and make the world a better place any way you can by sharing the positive energy. Well, what do you learn from your students? How have your students contributed to your growth as a yoga practitioner? Students are reflections, yeah. And 
I've always felt that there's so much to learn as a teacher from students. Everyone has a story. And I felt that people talk about ethics in yoga. I think that ethics means we should treat everyone with equal respect. Everyone that comes into that room deserves respect because we do not know what they've had to do to get their body into that room. Yeah. What do you learn from students? You start talking to them about their life, whether they can jump through or jump back or, or they're flexible or not. Wow, they might be working two jobs. They might be having all kinds of struggles and difficulties and they're getting their, self, their body to that class and they're doing yoga. So you can learn by the, the struggles other people have and gain some compassion and see how they are really using this yoga in a very powerful way. And it's not always the person that can do all the tricks. It's easy to keep coming to yoga when you're getting praise and you're flexible and strong. But there are people that are coming in there with great difficulty. I had a woman recently, she's from Germany, she's blind from birth. Yeah. She's attended my teacher training course twice. She's learned adjustments for every posture in the full primary series. Something I ask students is this, because this is woman has never seen. I'll say, imagine for a moment, and honestly, this is virtually impossible for those of us with sight to imagine, but I want you to imagine for one moment, you have never seen anything. So you've never seen a yoga magazine, you've never seen a yoga photo, you've never seen your reflection in a mirror, you have never seen yoga. You come to a yoga class, and what is left? How do you feel? So something I learned from this student is that, how do you feel? Shelly, my wife Shelly and I worked in, and Austin has one of the largest schools for the blind in America. And we went in, and I was doing a teacher training in Austin. I brought all the teacher trainees to this school. And these are kids, not only are they unsighted, but many of them have severe disabilities or in wheelchairs and, and all kind of, of trauma in their life. They've been abused, etc. So they couldn't do much physically, and each teacher was working with one of these students. So we would have them do simple things. I did a yoga demo for these kids. So how do you demonstrate to someone who can't see? First, I told the students, I said, I'm going to describe to you in words a yoga posture. Then the teacher next to you is going to put their body into that yoga posture. I want you then to feel their body. Oh, great. And then you try to emulate that, and your teacher will help you. All right? We were in tears with the, the level that these kids were going, but also there was one woman, young woman that Shelley was working with. She had a hard time even standing up or sitting down. So we had her stand and hold her arm and just to breathe to create a vinyasa, which was just inhale and exhale and folding. And she became so excited. She was like, wow, whoa, this is so cool, wow. And I realized, how jaded are we? This woman felt the juice, she had it. She was like, I'm breathing, That's I'm right, flowing. Dude. And we're like, oh, my practice wasn't so good today. I couldn't stand on one hand, I couldn't jump through. We're losing the beauty and the essence and these are the kind of things I might not have had that same level of realization without those people's help. David, that is a beautiful way to end this segment and I think we'll get ready to move into the next segment where I'm gonna ask you some specific questions that have come in from students about the practice itself. Fantastic. Thank you.